Thank 
Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya About 
how Lakshmi is very chaste, but she still wanted to enter into Lord Krishna's pastimes. And Mahaprabhu explained to this Brahmana that Lakshmi desired to enter into the rasa dance with Lord Krishna. <laughs> so at one point, Mah Mahaprabhu was saying, Lakshmi is chaste. He said, why did she want to dance with another man? Her husband is Narayan. Why would she want to dance with Lord Krishna? And then Balababhata, the Brahmana, said to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he said, oh, said, oh, stop joking with me. You know, Lord Krishna is the same as Lord Narayana. But then Mahaprabhu said, yes. Yes, but why don't, why didn't she get in? Why was she not admitted into the Rasta? And uh, the, the Brahmana the, from Sri Ranga, the Rangan, Rangana, Brahmana, Pujari, he said, well, I don't know. Why didn't she get into the Rasa dance? But Chaitanya Mahaprabhu explained that this is the difference, that Lakshmi is the consort of Lord Narayana, and she worships Lord Narayan. But with Lord Narayan, they're in the mood of Vaikuntha, which is the mood of awe and reverence, or Aishwarya, opulence. So where, where there is opulence, there is a distance. There's a distance between Lord Narayan and Lord Narayan's devotees. Just like you go to Tirupati to see Lord Balaji, you don't get very close. We see the Lord only briefly, only very briefly from a distance. <laughs> In the Gaudiya tradition, we have big uh, kirtan mandaps in front of the deities. And we can have darshan of the deities for a long time. Not just for a, a moment or two, but we can have the, the darshan for, for a long time. In Mayapur, you can stand in front of Radha Madhava and the Astasakis, and you can be there for hours looking at the deities and appreciate the But in the Sri Vaishnava tradition, the darshan is short, more reverential, more worship. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu stayed there in Sri Ranga for the four months of chapter Masha. And during that time, he also carved a set of Jagannath gates. He carved his own Lord Jagannath gates and worshipped them. So now is the, tomorrow is the Ekadasi and it's the last Ekadasi in the Chaturmasya, meaning there's only five, six more days before the end of the Chaturmasya. And of course, this is the month of Karti, the auspicious month of Karti, where we're worshiping Lord Damodha. So tomorrow, with the, the, the last is a very important Ekvarasi, and it's the beginning of the Bhisma Pancha. Bhisma Pancha. So a number of devotees, they also like to observe some kind of <laughs> vows during this period, during the end of the Chaturmasya, the 
last five days the, for the period of Gishma Pancha. Just as for Chaturmasya, devotees make some vows. Some different vows will be made. Some people will make vows to do more chanting. Some people will make vows taking only one meal a day. Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati Prabhupada, Srila Prabhupada's spiritual master. Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati Prabhupada observed Chaturmashya without shaving. So you see, you, you often see the photograph. Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati with the, the beard. So that's also a, a vow which some people make during Chaturmasya. They don't shave, they don't cut the nails. It's a, an austerity of the body. So some, sometimes the devotees will observe that kind of vow. Srila Prabhupada didn't encourage it for the Western devotees. <laughs> Western devotees. For Western devotees not to cut the hair, it's like a, a sense gratification. <laughs> Most of them had long hair at the time of becoming devotees. Not all. Makunda Goswami describes he was Makunda Maharaj, he was one of the very first devotees, and he describes how he met Prabhupada. He always points out, he said, I didn't have long, he didn't have long hair. <laughs> so many other people did have long hair, but he, he did. He was a musician, but he didn't have long hair. So chapter Masya, people will undergo that kind of austerity for four months, maybe taking only one meal a day. And sometimes people also will write to this, how many mouthfuls of food do you take? <laughs> like that, uh, doing some of great austerities. So of course, it's difficult for us in this time in this society, we're not so much accustomed to do that kind of austerity. But the, the last five days of Chaturmasya, this period which is called the Bhisma Pancha, this is an opportunity for people to make a vow and at the same time get the blessing you get blessings of uh, the whole chapter much. You never did anything that, you know, we didn't, maybe we didn't do anything very significant during the four months, but at least for the last five days, you may like to do some kind of little austerity or sacrifice, yajna. So, there are different ways in which you can do it. Srila Prabhupada particularly points out that ikadasi is meant for increasing our hearing and chanting. Sometimes people think ikadasi is just for fasting and they will fast and they don't do anything. <laughs> they hardly chant. They're so weak <laughs> sometimes, you can't do anything. So that's not encouraged. And there's a famous pastime which is told how Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati Prabhupada uh, in his Godiamat. One time it happened that the devotees were observing Ikadasi. And at that day, on the Ikadasi day, someone came and invited the devotees to come for a program. But they said, oh no, we're observing Ikadasi today. We're all fasting. We're not going for any programs. So somehow, Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati Prabhupada found out about it. And he said, then you should cook prasada. And everyone take prasada and go for the program. And he said that 
the preaching is more important than the fasting. So Sri Prabhupada also pointed out this to the devotees, that the real purpose of a Pharisee is to increase our hearing and chanting. Srila Prabhupada used to have us all chant 25 rounds on a Karyasi. It's not very common these days, but in Srila Prabhupada, when I joined the movement, certainly that was the practice on a Karyasi. Actually, when I joined the movement in the days of the movement, I joined in London. And so the devotees, we had the custom, we would go out for Sankirtan every day. We would go out in the morning and then we would go out in the afternoon for Sankirtan. But on a Kadisi day, we wouldn't go out in the morning. We would not take breakfast, but we would take lunch. We would have a lunch. We have a good lunch. Srila Prabhupada pointed out that you, you want to have more time for hearing and chanting. So if you want to have more time for hearing and chanting, then you spend less time eating. <laughs> right? If you spend less time eating, you have more time to hear and chant. People often say, oh, I have no time. Oh, I have no time to chant. I have no time to read the books, but we take time to eat. We take time to cook and eat. But if we minimize the cooking and the eating on the ecclesi day, then you have more time to chant. So this is an austerity approach, austerity. Tapasya. Tapasya is recommended. In the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna says, acts of sacrifice, penance, and austerity should never be given up. And similarly, one of Srila Prabhupada's favorite slokas in Srimad Bhagavatam was a verse spoken by Lord Rishabdi. Lord Rishabdi instructed his 100 sons. Right? Do you know who were the sons of Lord Rishabde? Lord Rishabde? Who was his eldest son? Barak. Barak. And then who else were his sons? Who? <coughs> no, there were nine famous sons of Barak of uh, Rishabde. And then Barak was the most famous. Then there was the Navyogindras, the Nanyogindras. They were all Mahabhagwas. They were preaching. You can read about them particularly in 11th time. So they were, and then there was the nine sons who also got the kingdom, who got the land of the whole world, Mahakrishabdi rule the world, he divided the world between his sons and the other sons were all Brahmins. So anyway, Lord Rishabdi, Maharaj Rishabdi, he instructed his 100 sons. Before he retired, he was a king and he was preparing to enter the forest. Vanaprastha. Somebody was asking me just today, they were asking me about what is one's duty? You know, we come if you come here to a place like Dubai and you're working. How long are you expected to work? What is the, the norm? How long should we keep working? And how long are you going to keep yourself in this kind of condition? So the Vedic culture divides life into ashrams. When people get married, become rehasted, family life, it's not that they should remain in that condition. 
he entered into the Grihastha Ashram for some time. And then you meant to move on. You meant to move on. In other words, you have to prepare for the next one. Hmm? There's a next a next life to be thought you have to think about. Not just only this life, but you have to think about the next life. And it's very important for us to take some time to prepare for that. And so enter into Grihasta life and you have a family and children and working and earning. But then at some point, there has to be retirement. It's, you know, some parts of the world, people don't retire. They just work until they drop. That's not very good. If you just work until you drop, that's not quite Vedic culture. The Vedic culture says, Pancha Sorbam Banam Rajit. From the age of about 50, you should go to the forest. Now, of course, this is Kali Yuga. The forests are practically, there's no forest here. <laughs> My God, where's the forest? There's no retreat. But Prabhupada said, Kali Yuga can go to the forest, go to the Iskon Center. Take shelter from this Iskon Society. Particularly, Prabhupada said, we have made nice centers in Mayapur and in Vrindavan, holy places. That was in Prabhupada's time. Now, there's many, many more temples, wonderful temples, all over India, and not only India, in other parts of the world also. But particularly in India, it's very convenient to take up spiritual life and to devote oneself fully to the practice of bhakti yoga. So Lord Prashyati instructed his sons, Nayam deho deha pujam niraloki, kushtam kamar nahate pujam ye, he jodhi yam kushtayena sarvam, shudayat jasma, Lord Rishabdi is telling to his sons that don't just work for sense gratification because that sense gratification is there even for the pigs which eat stool. The pigs which eat stool, they're also eating very nicely, filling their bellies and sleeping comfortably. The, the animals which eat stool are doing these things. So human life is not meant for that. We're not meant to live like animals and just only engage in the animal propensities. Human life, Lord Rishabe told his sons, is meant to do have to do some papashya, hapodhya. You have to do some austerity, a little austerity. People are frightened when you talk about austerity. Oh, no, no. What do you have to do? Stick needles in yourself or, you know, torture yourself? No, no. It's not really necessary. What is the austerity? The austerity? Well, there are four pillars of religion. Satyam Sojam Daya Tapa. Cleanliness, mercy, austerity, truthfulness. In our Krishna conscious practice, we are encouraging people to follow these four principles. And generally in every culture society, people will respect cleanliness, mercy, austerity and truthfulness. So what is this austerity? Austerity means to give up pride. To give up pride. 
that pride comes with identifying with the material body. And Lord Krishna has explained in the Bhagavad Gita that we're not the material body. That the material body is like the dress. And just as we change the clothes, we change also <coughs> the body. Just like the clothes get old, you give up the old clothes, you get new clothes, right? And the same way the body one day breaks down, you give up the body, you get a new body. It's not something to be lamented. Well, of course, it depends what kind of body you get. Right? We want to be, we, we do think about that. Where are we going in the next life? What kind of body are you preparing for? We think about the future. We think about the future, planning for the future. We're thinking next life also. Where do you want to go? Where do you want to be in the next life? So Lord Rishabdev was telling his sons that they should do some tapasya. They, they should undergo a little tapasya. We also tell people, Cleanliness, mercy, austerity, truthful. Austerity is destroyed by intoxication, taking intoxicants. If people take intoxicants, they won't be austere. You know, people who go drinking, they go to the nightclub or something, to drink, they're not going to do any austerity. They're intoxicated. Another kind of intoxication is pride. That pride, that identification with the material body. And we have to give up that. We have to purify. So austerity helps us to get rid of this kind of consciousness. The bodily concept of life can be removed by doing austerity. And by doing austerity, then you can experience real pleasure. We want pleasure, we want happiness, but the real happiness comes from the soul, not from the body. The illusion is to make the body happy. God is never happy for long. One little problem with the body can give you so much pain. I, so many times I had some problem, little thing, just oh, it made, it made me so much trouble, so much pain, misery. One little thing to get pain in the body is very easy. To get happiness from the body is very difficult. How to get happiness out of this body? We're trying to find happiness. So the real happiness is in the soul. We want to awaken that consciousness. So this Bhishma Panchak, as I said, which begins tomorrow and runs just for five days from the Ekadasi to the Purnima. Right? So five days. And we, we do some Make some bow. So we encourage everyone to make a bow. To particularly to do chanting, to chant the Hare Krishna mantra every day for five days, to do more chanting maybe than you usually do. More chanting. That is the real tapasya. You do more chanting. And of course, we also this. We also encourage people worship Lord Krishna in his form as Damodar by offering a lamp to the Lord. 
this is the this is the yagya. The yagya. Kali Yuga Dharma, Harinam, Sankirtan. The Yuga Dharma is chanting the holy name. So you can do this yagna, chant the Hare Krishna mantra. And you can do also this little tapashya, this austerity chanting Hare Krishna. <laughs> Spending more time to chant Hare Krishna. Very beneficial. And if you observe it during this period, beginning tomorrow for the five days, the Bhisma Panchat, you get the benefit of doing the whole Chaturmasya with a discount. Okay? So when we will, we we'll like bargains. People like bargains too. And so, Lord Krishna, or from the Vedas, from the Vedic scriptures, they have given these discounts that we can get the benefit of Chaturmasya by following this Bhisma Pancha just for five days to do more chanting and more hearing, more reading of scriptures like Bhagavad Gita, Srimad Bhagavad. Not very difficult, but you get so much benefit. So this is the principle. We want to benefit ourselves. How to benefit ourselves? I was. We were studying Srimad Bhagavatam today. We were hearing about Lord Shiva. So Daksh, Lord Shiva's father-in-law was Daksha. The father of Sati. Lord Shiva's wife was Sati. His father in law was Daksha. So Daksha was thinking, My daughter has married Lord Shiva. The Shiva, he's a poor man. I, one, one lady came to me and said, My daughter had some bad luck. Oh, what happened? She married a poor man. <laughs> <laughs> it's not similarly, you know, Daksha was thinking, uh, my daughter, Sati, she's married a poor man. You know, Lord Shiva has no, no house. He lives under a tree, right? He lives in Kailash. He has his own abode. <coughs> A beautiful abode, a beautiful place under the banyan tree. There's a story that at one point he did have a house. They built a house. Mm -hmm. But then when they were doing the Griha Pravesh, all the Brahmanas came and did the Griha Pravesh. And then they demanded <coughs> charity. And so they took away everything. <laughs> there was no house left to, to give no return. And so it's Lord Shiva said, no point to build houses anymore. Anyway, Lord, the point is, Lord Shiva is not a poor man. The Daksha was thinking he's a poor man. But he didn't know that the wealth of Lord Shiva was a vyakta. It wasn't, <coughs> wasn't visible. It wasn't manifest. What was the real wealth of Lord Shiva? The wealth of Lord Shiva was his renunciation and his love of God. Lord Shiva is a pure Vaishnava, a great, the greatest Vaishnava, and he has love of God. That is his wealth. <laughs> so Daksha, he, you know, he was a, he couldn't really understand these things, but. Sati, his wife, understood. <coughs> so we encourage you also to understand what is the real, the real wealth of the world. That it's not in paper money. <laughs> it's not in motor cars or property. It's sometimes pointed out that while devotees of Lord Shiva may be very wealthy, 
they're not very peaceful. They don't have peace of mind. They're often very passionate and influenced by the, the lower modes. But the devotees of Lord Vishnu, they may not be very wealthy, but they're more peaceful and happy and satisfied. They have control <coughs> over their mind and self. So you have to consider what kind of life you prefer. Do you prefer to be peaceful and or do you just simply want all the sense gratification and the agitation which comes along with it? So these are some considerations. We want you to understand that. This month we are worshipping Lord Damaja. It's very simple. We offer lamps to Lord Damaja. <laughs> and it's a humble offering to the Lord. But it's highly appreciated by Lord Krishna. Any devotion done during this time gives you hundreds of times more benefit than at any other time in the year. Are there any questions? Hare Krishna. If there are no questions, then we will do Dhamma Jai Puja. We can sing the Dhamma Jai. Namo Vishwanam Sachi Let's go.